Good morning. Let's remember that we are baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Are your sails torn? Is there a, are you even in the eye of the storm this morning? Okay, or is the storm still raging around you, tearing up those sails a little bit more? Hopefully, Habakkuk has an answer for us. And I want to read the portions of the text that I want to use in our meditation and in our learning this morning from the Lord. I've been blessed to be here this morning. I hope that God will use me as a blessing for you as well. From chapter 1. Don't worry, there's only three chapters to Habakkuk, so we're not going very far. Okay. Chapter 1. The oracle that Habakkuk, Habakkuk the prophet saw. O Lord, how long shall I cry for help? And you will not hear. Or cry to you violence, and you will not save. Why do you make me see iniquity, and why do you idly look at wrongs? Destruction and violence are before me, strife and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed, and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous, so justice goes forth perverted. From chapter 2. I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower and look out to see what he will say to me and what I will answer, concern, what I will answer concerning my complaint. And the Lord answered me, write the vision, make it plain on tablets so he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits its appointed time, it hastens to the end, it will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him. But the righteous shall live by his faith. The end of chapter 3. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God the Lord is my strength. He will make my feet like the deer's. He will make me tread on my high places. And it ends by saying, to the choir master with stringed instruments. Ta-da, Chris. Okay? And we will be singing those songs and have sung these songs of faith to this point so that this message will take root in our heart in a beautiful and special way as we look at it. The theme of the message, if you would pull that up real quick on the slide. I think we still got them from there. Just in an unjust world. How do you get just in an unjust world knowing that perhaps we're not as just as we think we are? Okay? And if we're not as just as we think we are, that means we're unjust. And so how do we get just inside of our own presence of injustice, much less the injustice in the world around us? Habakkuk, 609 to 587 B.C. 2,620 something years ago, he said these things. Okay? Oh, I, I, something, Pastor Marty wanted to make sure, next slide please, that you knew how to pronounce the name Habakkuk. Is it Habakkuk, 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 okay? There it is, pronounce it just like that, okay? <laughs> and just to make it easier for it, I put it in modern Hebrew rather than ancient Hebrew, okay? There's ancient Hebrew of, over there, you see how much more difficult that is? This is much easier, right? Okay, now we know, Habakkuk, okay? There you got it. If you really want to be Jewish, you can go, Habakkuk, but you've got you to gotta, you know, clear your throat on it, all right? Okay. Okay, Marty, that's all taken care of. Everybody knows how to pronounce that name now. But more important to me is what it means. Scholars have debated. If you think it means like a cucumber or something like that, they take it from an Assyrian. But I'd rather go to the Hebrew language itself, which is what it is. And if it's go there, it means to be hugged, to be embraced. 
The name could be even worse, I suppose. It would be Gagabakukia. Okay. All right. Add God's name to it because it means God reaches out and hugs his people. As he hugs this prophet in order to, for him to give his message forward to us in our day as well as his. 2,600 years ago, he says some of the things he says here. There's three things I want you to take away with you as we go, as you go from here today. We brought a lot of stuff in here with us, and we want to deal with that, and we want to deal with it first. But there's three things that are go I'm going to, to show you from these three chapters. I have to admit, there was only two chapters in the religious lesson that was assigned, but I added the third one, okay? So I wanted three points to the sermon, all right? So we could get it all in, all right? But it really made a beautiful ending, and I can't see talking about the prophet Habakkuk and not talking about the third chapter where he sings the song of praise. We've begun the service singing songs of praise. We've had in the middle songs of praise. We're going to end the songs of praise. And Habakkuk says, like, say, here, I've got this thing I want to discuss with you, God, but praise be your name. Baruch Hashem. And so, Habakkuk, the one who was hugged by God and given this message and was emboldened to argue with God because, as you saw at the first part, there was a question he had. Question, please come up with that if you would. The question is very simple. And so the first part is the big question. Why is there injustice and violence? Okay? Why is there injustice and violence? Pay attention to what he says there as we go over this again. Notice how he says, the oracle that Habakkuk, the prophet, saw. O oh Lord Adonai, how long shall I cry for help and you will not listen? How long will I cry out to you violence and you will not save? Why do you cause me to see evil while you look at trouble? Destruction and violence happen before me. Contention and strife arise. Therefore the law is paralyzed and justice does not go forth perpetually. For the wicked surround the righteous, therefore justice goes forth perverted. Wow. 2,600 and something years ago, Habakkuk was coming off of a high, if you would. The great king Josiah had set to reform the land according to God's law. Somebody finally paid attention after messing it up. And he took and he threw out the idols from the temple that shouldn't have been there. He took and all the rites and practice of the pagan world that shouldn't have been there, he re put those out. And he painted and redid and, re and refurbished things. And they even found a book of God's teaching of the Torah inside the temple. And he wanted the people to read it. And when they heard, they cried. This is what it means to know God. This is what it means. Like they had forgotten. Oh, it was great. In 609, he was killed. And what is sad about it, and his son took over, in three months, he was killed. Then another son took over, and he decided, I liked it was before when daddy had everything all dusted up. And everything, everything began crashing back in. The rituals came back into the temple. The idols came back into the temple. The evil came back into the society like it was just under the surface, ready to explode. And Habakkuk cries, why? Why is this happening? Why? It was going so good, God. All right? I was on the train to that one. All right? But now it's like it's a derailed. Yeah, like it's big derailment. Okay? it gets worse. These kings lift themselves up as though they're mighty and they decide they're going to claim the world for themselves over against Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar. It didn't work. Oh, brothers and sisters, it didn't work. Okay. Babylon marches to, I mean, Nebuchadnezzar marches to town in about 604 and takes the king away and puts another one in who does the same thing as the one before him, okay, and rises up and he brings an army back and takes away a bunch of more people and that still didn't work. It all happens again. And in 587, the voice of Habakkuk finally comes to fruition and down goes the temple, 
the city walls, the city. In fact, the biggest level of destruction you can find in the city of Jerusalem in the old David section where they are doing the archaeological work, you come down to this level of the city and it's 10 foot of rubble or more piled up from this period. Nebuchadnezzar had had enough, but really behind Nebuchadnezzar, God had had enough. Okay? And it was bad. Why do you use evil people to get at your people? Why, do you, why is all this going on? It, was, it looks so good. It looks so good. You know, rulers have a way of thinking they can control the world. Sometimes we are influenced by rulers who are conniving and evil in their background. And we can see the evil that they've done and the lies that they've told. Sometimes people run to be our rulers who are just boisterous, okay? Seem to have a personality that is egocentric and narcissistic and they talk about all the great things that they can do and to bring us back to who we are as a people. But those are not the answers. That's not what Habakkuk found as the answer. It was not Jerusalem and Israel being the best it could be as a city and a mighty power in the world. It was not trying to find the best way to get diplomacy done and to to cheat on our way up. In fact, all those things come out and say, those are just pure blood on the hands of those who lead and guide the people. Well, what is it then, Lord? What, what is, what's going on? Why is this all happening? And if it's not bad enough, we ask the question of the evil that's out in the world. Oh, brothers and sisters, when we walk in here, we bring some of it with us, don't we? Don't we? Some of you in here have seen violence in your life that the rest of us would shudder if we saw. And you're struggling with the effects of that violence in your heart and your soul. Where do you go with it? Some of us have tendencies that direct us this way or that way. What do you do with it was driving you on to something that is not God-like in what you do? How do you handle those things that are... And the anger that's out there in society is also in us. And how do we not let the society and its violence tap into that anti-God anger that we have in our heart and our soul because we are afraid. We are afraid for our children, for our grandchildren. We are afraid for our jobs. We are afraid of a lot of things. And we think that the violence of this world can be the answer. So Habakkuk raises the big question, why does it seem that the world seeks violence and injustice as a way to become righteous in this world? How does a person become righteous in this world? That leads us to part two. The big question gives way to the big answer. It says, faith waits. Listen to the words. Listen to the words. I will stand at my post, says Habakkuk, and station myself on the rampart. And I will keep watch to see what he will say to me and what he will answer concerning my complaint. Then the Lord Adonai answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain on the tablet so that it might be read quickly. For there is yet a vision for the appointed time. It will give witness to the end and it will not lie. It, if it tarries, wait for it. For it will surely come and not delay. Look, his spirit within him is puffed up. It is not upright. But the righteous shall live by his faithfulness, by his faithfulness. Those are such powerful words that at least three times in the New Testament they're used as the basic for understanding the work of Jesus Christ. Paul, in writing to the Galatians who have left the faith and are shaking on it a little bit, uses this as one of the ideas of how 
you become righteous before God. Not because of your goodness and personal ability, but it starts with your faith in the one who makes you righteous. He uses it in the book of Romans, right? I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the power of God for the salvation of souls because the righteous will live by faith. The book of Hebrews in chapter 10, just before it talks about faith, uses this passage to raise the question about the faith that gives life as opposed to the ways that bring death. Faith waits. In the midst of all the trouble, in the midst of the storm, and when you reach that eye of the storm, there's still a time to wait because what's... Ever thought about the song, The Eye of the Storm? The eye of the storm doesn't mean the storm is over. You realize that, don't you? It means it's going to come from the next direction when it comes around. Because it's going this way and all of a sudden you go all the way through. Oh, and then all of a sudden while you're watching it go that way, it hits you in the back of the head the other way. Ever had that happen in life? Okay. Have you ever done that in life? Okay. The storms are within. You think, oh boy, I've, I'm done with that. And the next thing you know, you're going that way with your inner turmoil and your struggles and your angers that you would express out. And your family and your friends live in the eye of your storm, in the eye of your life. Faith waits. Faith is God grabbing your heart. It really is not about you. It really isn't. It's about what God has done for you. He has given you faith. He has showed you who he was. He is the one that holds on to you. He is the one who sends Jesus to be the means by which your sins are forgiven, who is the peace of, that passes all understanding, who is the one who is the mighty Lord and Savior. And he goes right into the eye of the storm. That's what the cross is all about. It's not the eye itself, but the storm itself that's around it. And we get to stand in the eye and watch the storm happen on the cross. And the sun go black. And the day turn into dark on him so that we can live in the light and see the resurrection power of God. But we have to let God do his thing. And that means that faith waits for God to show us and guide us and direct us. And it waits in the love of our Savior, not just because we receive that love, but because in waiting we have a chance to show that love. Don't go with your thing. Don't go with your plan. Don't go with what you think should be the case. Go with God, okay? And the love that he shows on the cross is the love that begins to radiate from your heart and your being. It is no longer I who live, but Jesus who lives in me. Faith waits. It's going to happen. You're going to see salvation in all sorts of forms, and you're going to see the great salvation. And when it is your own body against you in your sickness or your health, your own mind against you in the way the troubles come to you and the way you handle them and the way you crumble and cry in your life, and we crumble and we cry and the tears drip, and we wait. We wait. Number three, number three, the big prayer, the big prayer. What do you do while you're waiting? I would suggest you pray. That's what Habakkuk did. Habakkuk, he got there and says, let me be faithful through it all. That's the prayer. That's the prayer. He praises the God who says, look at this, though the fig tree does not bloom, nor there be fruit on the vines. The yield of the olive tree fails and the cultivated field do not yield food. The flock is cut off from the animal pen and there is no cattle in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in Lord Adonai. I will exult in the God of my salvation. Lord Adonai, my Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like a deer. He causes me to walk on my high places to the choir master with stringed instruments, Chris, okay, and everybody around you, okay, so that we can sing of this great salvation. On well, this morning, a number of times, I happens, but this morning I came around the curve and guess what there was along the side of the road? Four deer. I see them all the time. I 
what are they doing in the middle of Cedar Park, okay? But they seem to like it, okay? And here they are. And they kind of j jiggled a little bit as I went around the corner, but they stayed right in their spot, and I didn't hit them, okay? That's kind of the thing that he's talking about here. We need to be sure-footed like that, or stay where you're put, and you won't get hit by the big truck coming around the corner, all right? But sometimes we get out there trying to do it all on our own, on our own strength. And we don't just get hit by the truck. We get the whole train to run over us, okay? Wait and give thanks in what goes on. Though everything is falling apart, give thanks to the Lord. Wait on Him. He has the whole universe planned. You think just because you slip or even because you die, his plan goes wrong? <laughs> Sorry, brothers and sisters, it doesn't, you know? He has you up in his plan. He has you there in his hand. Your life and your death, they mean everything to him and nothing to this world. They don't change his plan a bit, but they fulfill his plan for you. But how you live in that plan, waiting and praising and giving thanks to God and showing love to your brothers and sisters as God has loved you and his son, Jesus Christ, oh, that's what the waiting is all about. That's what we're called to have happen to us as Habakkuk discovers. The one embraced by God shares this embrace with us. And a beautiful hug it is as the arms of the one who died on the cross, comes to his disciples that Sunday morning and reach out even with the nail holes in the hand and say, peace be with you. As he walks beside the husband and wife on back home and wondering what all is about as he teaches them, perhaps reaches his hand out and says, haven't you heard what the Bible says? As he calls them from their fishing to the shore and feeds them once more, as he promises the Spirit from on high to them. God hasn't given up on us. From the eye of the storm where he is at, now in the resurrection, he calls into our storm because he's already been there. And he calls us through it, he calls him to himself. If you would, I want to see the next section here for kind of a quick summary. The just shall live by faith in this world of injustice as they pray thankfully for the presence and rescue of Jesus, now in our life and in the future of the whole universe, of the whole universe. What a blessing we have then in this, in this uh, little prophet from of old. What a blessing he has given to us by telling us to wait on the Lord, my soul, wait. What a blessing we have. One last thing is I found this graphic. I think this is really kind of cool because I like how everything that fails is put in small print, but what we're called in faith to do is put in bold prints. Oh, this would bold us down, but rejoice in the Lord. This is the day the Lord has made. Rejoice, I say, and again I say, rejoice. rejoice. And in all things, give thanks and all things give thanks to the one who has saved us. Please pray with me.